It is a great pleasure for me to welcome another Norwegian speaker, Hilde Eliasen Reestad. She is a uh, associate professor of peace and conflict studies here at Björknes College in Oslo. She has written her PhD at the University of Virginia and uh, has had a long career in international scholarship. She's a Fulbright alumna and she um, has been also uh, an alumna of the United uh, World College of the American West. And in our context for the Norwegian audience, she's also from Finnmark, which is a particular pleasure for us. The reason why we have invent, uh, invited Professor Restad to talk to us today is that she has written a book, and not just any book, a rather good book about American exceptionalism. Because it is a truth universally acknowledged that as soon as the United States suffers an economic setback, another debate on American exceptionalism is about to commence. To non-Americans, the debate on American exceptionalism is strange because to the non-American mind, of course, the United States is not very exceptional. Well, at least not compared to other great powers of the past. It was perhaps uh, because of these two nations' illustrious histories that uh, Barack Obama chose to mention them in his ill-fated attempt while holding a speech in Strasbourg where he argued that the United States is exceptional like other states. What he said was that I believe in American exceptionalism just as I suspect the British believe in British exceptionalism and the Greeks believe in Greek exceptionalism. This was a big mistake. Because uh, while some stated, saw this statement as just a statement of fact, others saw it as heresy. As illustrated in the statement becoming the centerpiece of Mitt Romney's presidential campaign, uh, where he argued that the American pres uh, president was not patriotic enough. He didn't believe most strongly enough in American exceptionalism. And as Hilde Resta points out in her book, the 2012 presidential campaign sometimes looked like a competition over who could say the words American exceptionalism the most. Today, Hilde has been invited to bring her rather broad and historically informed uh, analysis into the most present times. She is going to discuss American exceptionalism in the context of the presidencies of the two uh, most late American presidents, George W. Bush and Barack Obama. Professor Estad, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I am honored to be here. And thank you all for coming today. Um, I brought my cell phone up with me, not because I'm checking my email, but because I'm timing myself. I have some students here today who know that I usually go over time. All right. so. Um, thank you, Asla, for that introduction, and actually you perfectly started my theme because the very first sentence in my presentation is, why did American exceptionalism become such a prominent concept in the 2008 and 2012 elections? Um, the Republican candidates who lined up against Barack Obama in 2012, thinking they were the most patriotic of candidates, might have been surprised to talked more about American exceptionalism than Presidents Reagan, George H.W. Bush, Bill Clinton, and George W. Bush combined. I'm going to come back to that uh, rather intriguing piece of statistics, but first, let me tell you what I'm going to do today. I'm going to first briefly define and discuss the concept of American exceptionalism so that we know what it is we're talking about, what is it, and why does it matter. Does it matter at all? Second, I'm going to talk about the role that American exceptionalism has played in the presidencies of George W. Bush and Barack Obama. Finally, uh, if there's time, 
I will attempt to analyze just to what extent this concept has been useful in understanding these two presidencies and what the two presidents' different, very different ways of communicating the idea of American exceptionalism can tell us about the current position of the United States in international politics. But first, what is American exceptionalism? People use this term all the time, but what do they mean? There are generally two ways in which scholars have approached the concept of American exceptionalism. And the first way is to view American exceptionalism as an objective state of affairs, meaning that one can actually scientifically measure the ways in which the United States is exceptional. One can, for example, compare economic systems, constitutions, religiosity, political ideology, etc., in order to find that, lo and behold, the United States is so different from all other nations that it is, in fact, exceptional. Not just different, exceptional. This kind of scientific inquiry, however, is at its core not all that scientific. It's not actually an objective enterprise. Rather, it's quite normative. The idea of an objective, as opposed to ideational, definition of exceptionalism doesn't make a lot of sense. Why use the term exceptional if you don't mean better, if you don't mean superior? American exceptionalism cannot simply mean different because all nations are different. Trying to say that one nation is somehow more exceptional than all other nations is in fact a normative judgment about what nations are better than all the others. And that's why in my recent book, as Usler referred to, um, I base it on the assumption that American exceptionalism is best understood as an idea, or more specifically, an identity. And what do I mean by that? I argue that in the United States, most Americans identify quite strongly with an idea of American exceptionalism. Looking at this as a national identity, I argue that there are three components to this identity. And each component represents a different aspect of the perceived importance and historic significance of the United States in world history, which actually affects how the United States re relates uh, to the rest of the world which I will get back to when I talk about Bush and Obama. So the three aspects that make up this identity of exceptionalism are, first, the idea that the United States is distinct from what used to be known as the old world. Obviously, that originally meant Europe, um, but today I think that means the global community. And this is closely connected, of course, with how the United States was um, founded. It came out of a revolution that was explicitly against Great Britain and the old monarchical traditions of Europe. Second is the idea that the United States has a very special and unique role to play in world history because of how it came about, because of its unique values and its political ideology, meaning that the United States was the first modern republic coming out of the Enlightenment era. And so because of this, the United States has a special duty to shine this light to all other nations following it, because naturally one assumes all other nations are following the United States. Third is the idea that the United States will resist the merciless laws of history, and unlike other prominent powers in world history, will not rise to power and then fall, it will simply rise and stay on top. Uh, that is a subject that has been very prominent in the Barack Obama administration, which I will get back to. These three aspects have very important consequences for how the United States relates to the rest of the world. In my book, I argue that this identity, this self-understanding, has been powerful, persistent, and pervasive throughout American history. And furthermore, that this idea of American exceptionalism, in fact, has led to a rather constant US foreign policy of unilateral internationalism not just since the World War II and America's rise to great power, but in fact since the very inception of the Republic. 
But because this lecture is only 45 minutes, I will elegantly skip the last 220 years of history and turn to contemporary significance of American exceptionalism because Mr. Toya has told me only to talk about Barack Obama and George W. Bush. So let's talk about Bush. Many have argued that George W. Bush brought to the fore a distinctly new kind of American exceptionalism. And indeed, to go with that, a new kind of unilateralism in US foreign policy. The well-known political scientist Stanley Hoffman, for example, has argued that the exceptionalism of the Bush administration was, quote, something entirely new and particularly troubling, especially the bizarre claim that the US Constitution allows no bowing to superior law, such as international law, end quote. I think Stanley Hoffman is wrong, and let me tell you why. Much like American exceptionalism was expressed during the Cold War in the concept of the United States as the leader of the free world, I'm sure you've all heard that expression, President Bush formulated an exceptionalist vision of the American mission in the war on terror. In his address to Congress on September 20th, 2001, Bush said, quote, Freedom and fear are at war. The advance of human freedom, the great achievement of our time and the great hope of every time, now depends on us." End quote. Once again, the world was divided in two camps, one good and one evil. President Bush consistently framed the attacks of September 11, 2001 as an assault on freedom on the very core of what America was, as opposed to the alternative explanation, which could have something to do with US foreign policy in the Middle East. In the same speech to Congress, Bush offered the following explanation for why America had been attacked on 9-11. Quote, Americans are asking, why do they hate us? They hate what they see right here in this chamber a democratically elected government. Their leaders are self-appointed. They hate our freedoms, our freedom of religion, our freedom of speech, our freedom to vote and assemble and disagree with each other." End quote. So Bush effectively communicated the narrative of the United States as the exceptional leader of the crusade against terrorism. This good versus evil rhetoric is familiar. It's familiar from the First World War. It's familiar from the Second World War. It's familiar from the Cold War. As was the emphasis on the inherent innocence and moral superiority of the United States. As promised by world history, America was once again playing the most important role in a world historic play of good versus evil. In that sense, 9-11 did not change everything, as many people have argued. Rather, the way Americans perceived the world adjusted back to a worldview more compatible with the Cold War than that of the confusing 1990s. The War on Terror, in a sense, answered the question posed by Rabbit Angstrom, the main character of John Updike's Rabbit novels. Quote, without the Cold War, What's the point of being an American?" End quote. George W. Bush was the president who got to answer that question. The war on terror solved the American identity crisis of the 1990s. Predictably, though, <clears throat> the rhetoric of American exceptionalism espoused during the war on terror by the Bush administration worked better domestically than internationally. Indeed, after the Bush administration realized the war on terror had caused a colossal dip in esteem for the United States in the Middle East, President Bush dispatched his former advisor, Karen Hughes, on a listening tour throughout the Middle East. The tour was a spectacular failure. Wrote journalist Rami Houdi, quote, she, Hughes, never understood that her particular brand of moralizing and arrogant cheerleading Go, Muslims, go, reach for the sky. You can be modern and democratic if you try. Was part of the problem, not part of the solution." End quote. 
In thinking that public diplomacy consists of communicating American exceptionalism, our values are the best, be more like us. Rather than engaging in serious discussion over policy differences, the Bush administration erred gravely. Inconceivable as it were to the President and Karen Hughes that countries in the Middle East did not want to be more like the United States, the public diplomacy message during the Bush administration focused on the inherent superiority of American values rather than on the highly controversial war on terror and the war in Iraq. This is a prime example of the role that American exceptionalism played negatively during the presidency of George W. Bush. But what then of the unilateralism of the Bush administration? Did 9-11 change everything? I argue that in security policy, the Bush administration was not so different from their previous uh, predecessors. The foreign policy tradition of unilateral internationalism continued unabated. And in many ways, the unilateralism of the Bush administration, which, for example, us European allies found so disagreeable, can be found in other forms in the presidents coming before him. 9-11 did, however, provide the impetus for President Bush's foreign policy doctrine of unilateral internationalism to move from its originally intended limited focus on the great powers such as China and Russia to an expansive war on terror that was accompanied by a dominant narrative of American exceptionalism in the public discourse. It should be noted that the Bush administration's unilateral internationalism, while in keeping with previous foreign policy of his predecessors, was also a radical rhetorical expression of this tradition to an extent not seen since perhaps the Reagan administration. Like Ronald Reagan, Bush Jr. Mar uh, married the dominant narrative of American exceptionalism with a militarized strategy against an evil enemy, rallying the nation to stand united behind the flag. Or, as the well-known political scientist Richard Betts named the national security strategy of 2002, primacy in your face. Thank you, Osla. The change in tone from the Clinton administration was noticeable and was not well received by the global community. The change that many saw and commented on in the Bush administration from the previous president, Bill Clinton, was more of tone than of substance. But in diplomacy, tone matters. Bush has been seen as a president who presented a new kind of exceptionalism and a new kind of unilateralism in foreign policy, when in fact all he did was take the indispensable nation in its unipolar moment to its logical conclusion. His main mistake was not to put a fine diplomatic gloss on it, like his predecessor, Bill Clinton, was so good at doing. Now, what about Barack Obama? After the assertive and bold Bush administration, something peculiar happened in the 2008 election. The Democratic candidate for president, Barack Obama, was met with three rather unusual critiques. At first, Obama was accused of not even being born in the United States. In other words, Obama was literally not an American. This uh, is the infamous birther critique, arguing that Obama was born in Kenya, not in Hawaii. Next, Obama was accused in various and not too subtle ways of being anti-American. Neither of these rather blunt and obviously incorrect critiques worked very well. If you're, you're, not going to run, you're not going to run for president if you're anti-American. So it didn't really work. But these two critiques touched on something very real in an American society that was reeling from a severe financial crisis, a botched war on terror. Was this person so incredibly different 
from George Bush, the right kind of American to lead the United States in these uncertain times. After Obama's election to the White House, a third and more subtle way of arguing that the president was not really American emerged. Specifically, President Obama was accused of not believing in American exceptionalism. In an influential cover story for the National Review Online, Richard Lowry and Ramesh Panura wrote, quote, it is madness to consider President Obama a foreigner, but it is blindness to ignore that American exceptionalism has homegrown enemies, people who misunderstand the sources of American greatness or think them outdated. If they succeed, we will be less free, less innovative, less rich, less self-governing, and less secure. We will be less." End quote. Furthermore, President Obama's answer to a question very early in his presidency in 2009, whether he believed in American exceptionalism, as us Latoya quoted earlier, gave, gave credence to this suspicion. Obama was asked point blank, do you believe in American exceptionalism? Which is kind of a weird question to ask of an American president, but nonetheless, there it was. And Obama said, of course, of course he did. Just as I suspect that the Brits believe in British exceptionalism and the Greeks believe in Greek exceptionalism. That was not his full answer. But that sentence was picked up by every American media outlet and hotly debated back in the United States because it signaled a subjective understanding of American exceptionalism, not an acceptance of an objective reality. Obama was saying, of course, I think America is exceptional because I'm American, but other people think their countries are exceptional too. That's a subjective idea, not objective reality. And Obama had made a serious faux pas. President Bush had it easy in this regard, not in many other regards, but in this regard. He was the president who got to exclaim and affirm American exceptionalism after a national tragedy such as 9-11. As Obama had realized, however, the Bush solution was very tenuous and temporary. Bush insisted that the world still needed, in fact yearned for, American military interventions and old-fashioned Cold War leadership. How else could Vice President uh, Dick Cheney in all seriousness say that he thought American troops would be greeted as liberators in Iraq you don't really see Obama ever saying something like that. Obama was tasked with communicating a post-war on terror definition of the meaning of America in the world. As one advisor to Obama is reported to have commented, the administration's emphasis was on stealth and modesty, a, a kind of approach that is, quote, so at odds with the John Wayne expectation for what America is in the world, but it's necessary for shepherding us through this phase, end quote. And what is this phase? What is this phase that the United States is in that requires such different kind of leadership? It is perhaps the post-unipolar moment phase, the post-war on terror phase, the post-financial crisis phase. It's a phase that demands more quiet leadership, more emphasis on soft power, not the Karen Hughes kind of soft power, but an open and equal exchange of ideas between the United States and the global community. Obama seems to have grasped this, and thus his rhetorical strategy for formulating America's role in the world and America's mission in the world is so very different from Bush's. And of course, his rhetorical strategy lends credence to the suspicion that the United States is going to be less under a president whom ostensibly does not believe in American exceptionalism. 
Further evidence of this, many of Obama's critics have pointed out, comes from the President's handling of the Arab Spring and the turmoil in the Middle East. Barack Obama came into the White House very clearly aiming to lighten the military footprint in the Middle East. He was of the clear opinion that the United States needed to leave Afghanistan and leave Iraq. Not immediately, but after an appropriate amount of time. Obama, Obama's own analysis was that the military presence of the United States in the Middle East was fueling anti-Americanism and making it harder to win, if you ever can win, um, a fight against terrorism. So the Obama administration's initial approach to the Arab awakening was perceived as very hesitant, because it was hesitant. Obama took quite a long time to sit down and think what the United States should do in the Middle East. From the administration's perspective, being involved in two wars in the Middle East while also being wild, wildly distrusted throughout the region necessitated a cautious strategy. In the specific case of a possible and controversial intervention in Libya, this strategy was, unfortunately, by someone in the Obama administration labeled leading from behind by a White House official. This became a problem for Obama when he ran for re-election in 2012. Republican presidential hopeful at the time, Mitt Romney, latched onto the phrase declaring, quote, God did not create this country to be a nation of followers. America must lead the world or someone else will, end quote. I think a lot of Americans agreed with Mitt Romney on that. Of course, Obama did not shirk from Romney's rather obvious strategy of trying to own American exceptionalism in the election of 2012. And so Obama met that strategy head on by using the actual phrase American exceptionalism all the time. And in fact, in the end, playing the exceptionalism game better than Romney did. And of course, this is the solution to our little statistic riddle at the beginning of the talk, because Barack Obama is in fact the first president who has used the term American exceptionalism. That doesn't mean that other presidents before him haven't talked about American exceptionalism extensively, but they've used other terms. Bill Clinton talked about the indispensable nation. Ronald Reagan talked about the shining city on a hill. But only when Barack Obama was trying to get elected in 2008 and then re-elected in 2012, did it become an obvious challenge to this new kind of president that he had to actually come out and say the words, yes, I believe in American exceptionalism. But what about Barack Obama's kind of foreign policy? For all the differences in how Bush and Obama have formulated their own understanding of American exceptionalism, their security policy is in fact more alike than many seem to think or maybe want to think. First of all, Obama appointed an administration that could almost be labeled a hybrid Bush-Clinton third term. Such appointments reflected probably a pragmatic realization on the part of the very inexperienced Obama that in inheriting two major conflicts and of course a general world of, with a high degree of instability required a foreign policy team with experience and a degree of continuity from the previous administration. This kind of continuity became very clear in Obama's counterterrorism policies where the unilateral use of military power, specifically in the form of drone strikes, is a very important part of Obama's counterterrorism strategy. In fact, when looking at the changes that George Bush made from his first term to his second term, it becomes clear that Obama's security policies are quite similar to Bush's second term 
after Bush had learned some hard-learned lessons from the adventures of his first term after 9-11. That sounds weird when I say that, because people think of Obama and Bush as very different presidents. And they are very different presidents. But one man's inexperienced hope is probably no match for a hard power hegemon whose enemies and threats look very differently from the chair behind the desk in the Oval Office rather than from the inspired idealism of the campaign trail. Of course, this has rattled many on the left, as well as international observers sympathetic to Obama's message of hope and change in 2008. But it should not have come as a surprise to those familiar with the long trajectories of US foreign policy. The United States tends to act as it wants to in international politics. One, because it can. The United States is very powerful, and no one can really challenge the United States on a military footing. And second, because American presidents tend to believe that the United States will use this power for good. The United States should be the most powerful country in the world. It should lead the rest of the world. It will do so more virtuously than any other nation because it is exceptional. While Obama and Bush have formulated that very differently, I still believe that they both believe that to be true. Now, finally, the significance of American exceptionalism for these two presidents. One could ask, has American exceptionalism really affected the presidencies of Bush and Obama? Many people would argue that this is not an important variable when you're trying to explain international politics. All you need is hard power and a relative decline, and that explains everything about US foreign policy. It should be fairly obvious by now that, of course, I do believe that American exceptionalism is very important for understanding American foreign policy and the presidencies of Bush and Obama. The question is how? So George W. Bush got to be the last president of the American century, where American exceptionalism was objective truth and the world was still comprised of people waiting to be led by the indispensable nation. Because the world was changing perhaps more rapidly than the Bush administration realized, however, this rhetoric seemed to clash rather starkly with its audience, the global population. What had seemed annoying, but to some degree may be true in the 1990s, the United States as the indispensable nation, was now taken more as an insult. And you can't really invade a country, Iraq, under what seemed like false pretenses and still expect to be greeted as virtuous liberators, as Cheney seemed to think. So in the Bush presidency, the strong belief in American exceptionalism and its accompanying radical unilateralist policies clashed violently with the global community. Barack Obama saw that when he was yet to be the president. When he was outside of the White House, Barack Obama saw that and he understood that. And Obama is, I believe, the first post-American century president. But more than that, he might actually be the first post-modern president. Obama understands that American exceptionalism is a subjective idea, not an objective reality that the world must conform to. Of course, each American president teaches, um, teases out their own understanding of what American exceptionalism is and what it means in their time. And each American president must make it fit with their strategy for how the United States should act in the world. Bush, for example, easily defined enemies like Iraq and Iran, whereas Obama opens up for much more gray areas. For example, Iran is our enemy, but we must still talk to Iran. But Americans aren't necessarily used to gray areas. 
they have had a tradition of being told by their president that the world is black or white, good or evil. So today, people are confused. Is Iran good or is Iran evil? Tell us, President Obama. Another example of Obama's complex rhetorical support for American exceptionalism can be seen in the very tragic and very difficult case of Syria. In September 2013, Obama spoke on the possibility of a limited military strike against Syria to punish Assad for using chemical weapons. America is not the world's policeman, Obama said. Quote, terrible things happen across the globe and it is beyond our means to right every wrong. But then, with modest effort and risk, but when, with modest, modest effort and risk, we can stop children from being gassed to death and thereby make our own children safer over the long run, I believe we should act. That's what makes America different. That's what makes us exceptional. With humility, but with resolve, let us never lose sight of that essential truth." End quote. This speech was in fact fairly unusual. Obama is being very open about the limitations on US leadership. Obama is engaging in the complicated task of communicating a post-war on terror idea of the meaning of America in the world. I believe this is part of why the case of Syria has been so difficult for the Obama administration and why it has created so much controversy in the United States. And it's been very easy for Obama's political enemies to attack him for it. We know that the one thing Obama did not want to do was get more American boots on the ground in the Middle East. There is hardly any scenario that would make Barack Obama send American troops to Syria, or now Iraq, again. And yet, this horrible civil, now regional war, is portrayed on American TV as the archetypical crisis that, of course, America should do something about. America must do something. It must be a leader. It must take charge. But then the question becomes, well, but do what? What can the United States do in Syria? And Obama has apparently concluded, although this can of course change, that so far there has been very little that the United States can do that wouldn't make things worse. That is a kind of pragmatic analysis that is a little bit unusual in the American foreign policy debate. And it is certainly very different from what his predecessor did where the war on terror was placed together with a long tradition of good versus evil, with easily defined categories of friend versus foe, explained using the rhetoric of American exceptionalism. Whereas Bush, after 9-11, cast the United States in a familiar, familiar role as the defender of liberal democratic values against a totalitarian enemy, Obama has all but abandoned this familiar black and white narrative of the United States in the world. Obama seems to be making a complicated world more complicated rather than simplifying the story. But that makes it seem like a very unfamiliar world to an uncertain American public. Where the Bush administration told its domestic audience that the world shared the American exceptionalist narrative, Obama understands that that is not necessarily so. And he has the very ungrateful task of communicating this to an American electorate. Perhaps what makes Americans so nervous about Obama is that he seems to accept this current post-war on terror, post-something or other limits on American power. He believes in American exceptionalism, but clearly not the Bush brand of American exceptionalism. Rather, Obama seeks to return to an ideal in which the United States gets to lead more by example, less by boots on the ground. 
Obama has the very difficult task of trying to move beyond interpretations of American exceptionalism that have become deeply entrenched in the US political psyche since they won the Cold War. As he proclaimed in his inaugural address, America was ready to lead once more, but gone would be the crusading hegemon of the Bush years, and in its place would emerge a more tolerant, respectful, and humble nation. A nation whose power grows through its prudent use, whose security emanates from the justness of our cause, said Barack Obama, the force of our example, the tempering qualities of humility and restraint. This is more appropriate American leadership in a time of relative power decline. This realization is, however, not so popular in the United States. So Obama has had, and still has, a twofold challenge. Accustom Americans to a new role for the United States in the world, and accustom voters to a new kind of American in the White House. Thank you very much.